Okay. All right. Um, I'm sure we're going to have um, some more people um, join us, but um, we'll go ahead and get get started um, before I turn it over to Ron. Um, just a couple logistical items. Um, we do have a lot of people. We're already going over 150 here. Um, and um, that's, I expect to continue to grow. So um, we will move, once um, Byron starts, we will mute everybody. Um, we ask that you put your questions into chat. We have some monitors who will look, look, be looking at those. We'll answer them if we can in the chat. If not, we have a break um, a little while in that we'll, um, we'll be answering some questions. So um, please save them for them. Um, we have a lot of content that we got to get through and uh, um, not a lot of time. So um, please put them in there and please keep yourself muted once I mute you all. Um, um, so we don't pick up um, too much background noise. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ron. Hey, Chris, thank you. Uh, the numbers are so exciting. I want to welcome everybody. And this is indeed a global meeting. It's, it's really cool. I, I know the board is very excited and I hope you are too. Um, it's our first Zoom seminar in a sense. We had our annual meeting a couple of weeks ago. I thought it went well. And it's just good to see faces that I've known and a whole bunch of you I don't know, but it would be great to, uh, hopefully we'll get together in person sometime. We want this to be a great social experience and especially a learning experience. Uh, you will see their faces in passing here, but thanks especially to the board members, especially Bob Hammer, who's been uh, working on this. Chris is our PR, media, marketing, whatever person, and we thank you especially, Chris, for moving this along. It's really great. Okay, and um, yeah, he'll be our guide if things go south or whatever the expression is where yeah, you where are. We were, uh, oh, we were, we were in the storage unit, so we took a bunch of stuff from. Yeah. Okay, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move along. Okay, okay. and yeah. I'm going to, uh, without further ado, as we say. Chris, do you have everybody muted? Except me. I'm, I'm going to mute everybody here in a second, but um, okay, that's fine. Um, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and move to really no introduction. Uh, you know, our editor, if you remember, uh, he slaves with a, a pen and paper. No, wait a minute. You don't, no, you don't even know what those are, do you, Brian? Anymore. Anyway, uh, our LDC, our LD uh, journal uh, editor our design guru among others and he's our today's leader of the seminar so uh, again thank all of you for helping out and it's byron show and byron right. you'll, you'll probably have to unmute yourself here in a second but um i'm gonna mute everybody okay thank you ron and welcome everyone I'm going to uh, start uh, sharing the screen so you can see the slides. Um, again, as uh, Chris mentioned, we're going to do questions um, about probably 30 to 40 minutes in, depending on how long I take. Um, and then uh, we will um, do questions again at the end. So be sure to put your questions into chat. Some of them, the co-hosts will be able to answer directly. Um, others, um, ones that they think might be uh, applicable to the broader group will um, come up uh, during the um, uh, during the uh, question and answer session and I'll answer those there. All right. And let me make this a slideshow. All right, so we welcome everyone, whether you are um, brand new to layout design or an old hand, um, I hope you'll find something useful here. If you turned into a webinar called Make Only New Mistakes, expecting some life coaching, I, I don't know what to tell you. 
maybe say I'm sorry to your spouse once in a while at, at random times. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. So back to the layout design. Um, we're going to talk about making only new mistakes. That's the motto of the layout design SIG. The idea is that we'd like to um, uh, at least talk about best practices, publicize best practices, explore best practices so that um, any mistakes you make will be your own creative mistakes. And we're going to talk about three phases of layout design today. That's not the only way to do layout design, but this has worked well for me um, and for many others. A conceptual phase, uh, which is about theme and, um, uh, you know, purpose um, and uh, a more general idea. Then a structural phase, which is really a footprint phase. And then um, the detail phase, uh, which is where most people spend most of their time. Um, the conceptual phase, a lot of people give it short shrift, but in fact, in terms of importance, the conceptual phase is the most important phase. The reason I say that is because this is where you tell your story. This is where you um, make decisions that will provide long-term engagement and long-term enjoyment uh, of your layout. One of the things that has happened in recent years is the proliferation of model railroad CAD. Um, once CAD started being used, people thought they were experts um, with mixed results. Very often people put um, uh, CAD do CAD too soon. They do detailed things like um, yards too soon. It locks you in to a design that you may not even want in the end. And so I'm really going to talk, I'm going to stress a lot this conceptual phase um, and uh, the structural phase, and then finally detail, because the detail, you don't want to let the, the tail wag the dog. So in terms of conceptual design, again, it's um, a theme, it's uh, a concept, it's a place, it's a feeling, it's a story you want to tell. It's very soft, very fuzzy, very against many, many model railroaders' um, a way of thinking, but I believe it's important. So there are a lot of decisions you can make, um, and it's entirely your choice, of course. Um, some people are interested in operations, whether it's purposeful but casual or whether very rigorous. Um, uh, some people want to uh, make a, uh, an infrastructure for model rail fanning and scenery. Some people replicating prototype scenes is important. Some people are doing fantasy. Um, there are uh, layouts based on Middle Earth, um, layouts, at least one that I know of, based on Warner Brothers cartoons. Um, and so um, these are all ideas that you may have for your layout purpose, for your concept, for your theme, and they may mix and match to some extent. For some people, um, maybe your concept and your theme is, I wanna have two trains in motion on a couple of ovals. That's okay. Um, and, but the um, reason to do this conceptual thinking up front is in order to make sort of a touchstone that you can come back to. It's your plumb line um, that lets you say, let me test this against my concept. Um, it's a personality for your layout. It's your vision for the layout. And it's prioritized in terms of what story you want to tell. Now, I believe the conceptual phase is the most challenging, the most important, and the most often botched. Um, because uh, people get too involved in detail too soon. So it's an experience. It's what you as an operator or you as a viewer um, uh, get from the layout as you um, view it or interact with it. Um, there has to be some balance between signature elements. Uh, if you're doing Southern California, maybe a citrus packing house is uh, a signature element. Uh, if you're um, doing somewhere in Appalachia, maybe coal mines are the signature elements. And you wanna balance that between something that's unique and a signature element and typicality. There's lots and lots of uh, layouts that are so full of unique and idiosyncratic features that it feels 
unnatural. And so finding that um, balance to include some typicality is very, very important. And again, as I mentioned at the outset, <clears throat> this is your touchstone to come back to, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, really um, test what you're doing in the design versus your concept. Hey, so Byron, in, yes, so, I'm sorry. I'm going to break my own rule and interrupt you for a second Go ahead. Because, I, because I forgot we changed the order of one thing. Um, you're going to see a poll pop up. Uh, if you can answer that, that really help us in in structuring both this um, this session and future sessions. So it'll pop up on your screen if you just answer the questions. They would really appreciate it. Um, sorry, Byron. Um, go ahead. No problem. And I should point out, Chris is speaking to all of you, not me. He knows yeah, my yeah. answers to the poll already. Um, so in terms of capturing the concept, how do you do this? It's really a very personal process, I think. Some people um, like sketches and doodles. It's very important this is not to scale. It's unbounded. Um, it's um, something that um, works for you. But this is the freeform part. And it is very difficult for some model railroaders to really let your mind um, go a little broader and not think about a specific town scene or a specific yard throat, but really uh, take it uh, to, to a very wide, you're looking for a very wide capture uh, that you'll narrow down later. It could be maps, it could be scenes. Um, you may want to write out some prose. If you want to do poetry, that's up to you. I don't see how it works, but maybe that works for you. Um, you know, maybe written notes, um, but you want to not write 70,000 words. Um, because you want to then use this. This is a working, this capturing this concept is a working tool for you to use. Um, uh, some people like to collect photos of real and layout uh, scenes. Um, I think it's uh, a little bit dangerous. You want to be careful not to build a model of a model um, unless that's really what you're into. Uh, I have had people, I've worked with people who wanted to model an exact scene from a famous model railroad. To me, it's been done once, why do it again? But that's, uh, you know, that's what makes horse races. You're basically in the concept and capturing this concept, you wanna capture the signature essence of the prototype, either real or imagined, um, and also your preferences, your interests, your priorities. So this is really about you and capturing a, um, uh, a, a set of ideas that you can come back to and refer to later. Let's see. Not sure why I'm not able to advance here. There we go. All right. So um, I think maybe we did we miss a slide? No, we didn't. Okay, good. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, the next steps, once you have done a uh, conceptual, uh, captured the concept, we turn to structural design. You might um, more call this um, footprint uh, layout, um, but I started calling it structural design a long time ago and now I'm stuck with it. So this is um, the next phase we want to uh, kind of frame the design. We're now going to start to, we're to take that very unfounded thing. You remember I was talking about, Byron was saying, oh, be unbounded, be free, be loose. That was then, this is now. We're gonna start to be more um, uh, strict about how we're working. Um, this is gonna be now to scale, still rough, not details, but it's gonna to be to scale. So we have to frame the design. We have to choose the key elements that we wanna include in our layout um, and what level of fidelity we want. Now, fidelity could be described as looks like, a scene that looks like the real scene or a scene that works like the real scene. Doing both can often be a challenge in limited space. So we're gonna talk about how large a picture we want to um, capture, we want to try to capture. It's not only the size, the overall space that we're trying to connect, 
are trying to cap trying to model, but also the intensity um, and how much you know do you want uh, how how intense should the scene be? Again, most railroading there's a lot more space between elements than we can have in the model, so we want to um, kind of judge what we include now in this structural phase by the resources, how much time, money, space, um, uh, complexity, what's our skill level. Um, and so the project is kind of an amplified footprint. It's how the layout is gonna fit in the room, where the turn back curves are um, and so on. So um, let's go to the, the next step. And here are sort of steps in how uh, I created several different footprints for a design for someone um, and how you can kind of see examples of how this works. Um, you can see there's not a lot of detail. Uh, there was a specific, um, this is um, uh, Oregon, coastal and uh, um, interior Oregon was the prototype for this. Um, and so the, um, uh, there, was, there was supposed to be a yard. This uh, lumber mill, this sawmill is the BTS kit in HO. Um, that was a very important piece to have on the layout. And so that's drawn pretty rigorously to scale. Most of the rest is just plugged in. You can see there are some passing sidings, some yards sort of nominally um, drawn in but it's not a lot of detail. And the reason it's not a lot of detail now are, is there are two. One is I don't wanna spend a lot of time at this stage. Um, I wanna be able to have multiple passes, multiple options, multiple ways this might fit in the given space. Um, but also at the same time, I don't wanna get so locked in by design at this early stage that I close out on other opportunities, other options, other alternatives that might have been great. So this is uh, just some examples um, of how in the exact same space, the same prototype, the same emphasis, you can come up with different footprints um, that one of which might be the right one. So as we look at the details of one of these, which happens to be the one we chose, um, you can see that some things are very firm. There are some obstructions. Those aren't moving no matter how uh, far out I go in my concept. The obstructions are there. The negotiated boundary, that's not changing. <clears throat> where the room, uh, you know, where the room entrance is, those things are um, givens. So what we're doing now, <clears throat> is putting in this roughly sketched, it's to scale, but it's not detail. So we're putting in this roughly sketched footprint to try to um, get an idea of what's gonna fit where, what we have to do. Now I wanna talk some more about framing the scenes and I'm gonna spend a little time on this. So you have in your conceptual phase, you've come up with your real or imagined railroad um, and you've thought about what is engaging and characteristic. It might be about nostalgia. Um, you want to be able to pick a piece of this um, railroad that supports your concept. It has enough operating density if that's what's interesting to you. It has signature traffic and scenes. It has space for the structures that you want to build. Um, you've got to temper that always by your resource realities. This is a place where many people go wrong because reality really stinks. Um, and if you're not realistic about your skills, about the space, about what's a reasonable space to have, about how much room a turnout takes, um, about what a minimum radius should be, um, you know, 15 inches in HO for your challenger, is probably not going to work. Um, I don't want to tell you your business, but that's probably not going to work. So you want to um, take this conceptual thing that you've come up with, this beautiful concept, um, and now we're starting to be more and more realistic about what fits in our time, space, money, and so on. 
So let's take this imagined prototype. This is the area maybe I've identified of interest. There's a lot of interesting pieces to this. There are a couple of division point yards. Uh, there's a, a branch with um, uh, a terminal at the end. Um, there's a crossing with another railroad at grade and um, with some trackage rights, um, this helper grade uh, and so on. Now, uh, this would be a pretty big layout. So if you've got a gymnasium to put this into, more power to you. Um, but if you need to do this in something less, um, then you are um, really going to have to make some decisions. So how are we going to focus? How are we going to narrow this aperture down to just what, um, what fits in our space, time, and money? So... Very often, one division point yard, you can see the piece of the layout here that we're looking at. One division point yard may be all you can model. There's a lot of talk and interest in modeling two division point yards. Um, that's great if you've got the space. Most of us don't. So one division point yard um, and then maybe some uh, uh, a couple of towns and the branch. That would be an interesting model railroad. One of the key items that I found works very well, both from operating standpoint and from a design standpoint, is to position the division point yard that you are actually going to model near the staging yard. This uh, makes the length of the run long in one direction and very short in the other. Um, but rather than putting the division point yard in the middle and creating short runs on either end, uh, making one long run often works better. Um, and this is a layout a number of us are familiar with um, here in our own area uh, is Rick Fortin's terrific um, Santa Fe layout. The layout is designed very much like this. And so the runs from what would be West staging here to Weston are um, basically transfer runs out of staging into the yard um, if they're not through trains, uh, they don't have an assigned road crew. Uh, there's a, a, a hostler slash um, yard master uh, slash, um, you know, kind of transfer operator who makes those moves. So most of the crews get on a train in the equivalent of Weston here and drive away and have a real experience with less, with fewer, at least, model railroad thoughts. But maybe this is too much space. We, we still like this concept. We still like this prototype. But this might be more space than we can afford. And maybe I want to do more switching. For me personally, switching is my one of my main interests in the hobby. So let's choose a different yard, not one of the vision point yards that's huge um, and is going to take more time, money, and space than I've got. Instead, let's pick a different kind of yard. Um, this is a junction yard where um, maybe the um, branch trains are built or terminate. Um, there's still a couple of towns and a branch, a lot of switching. You can still get in some yard switching, but you haven't committed the space and the complexity to a division point yard. So this is another way to take the same prototype, same concept to a degree, same area of interest, same locale, um, but do it in a little less space. But Byron, you say, I don't even have that much space. Okay, stop complaining, I say. Let's look at the alternative. Here's another alternative. Let's just focus on the helper operations um, through trains, um, interchange. Now, most of our original concept is staging. And one of the mottos, um, and I, I don't remember who came up with it first, maybe it was Craig Biscar, um, is stage when you can, yard when you must. If you don't have to build the yard and you don't have space for the yard, use it and let staging represent it. And in this case, some of these staging yards might be the same staging yard, just connected in different ways. So here we have uh, maybe it's a, uh, you know, a Southern Pacific and a Santa Fe um, railroads. I want to see some of both. 
So I model the trackage rights, I model the diamond, I model it interlocking tower, and a helper grade in one direction. Um, very, um, a, a very a more compact version of the same concept and prototype. Or we could go to the very, very um, smallest kind of configuration, which is to say, let's just do that um, uh, branch terminal yard, the local switching. We can have trains come in from multiple directions, um, swap some blocks maybe, or even just focus on the local switching. Um, and so this is a matter of framing. We're gonna frame the concept that we've come up with to an achievable scope um, and then do our structural footprint. And then later on, after we've done all that and we've iterated many times, lather, rinse, repeat, uh, we're gonna then come to the detail phase. So let's talk about some uh, techniques and tools and tips we can use during the structural design phase. Most people are familiar with selective compression. That's where you take um, a bridge that has seven arches um, and make it five, uh, or you know whatever the number might be. A certain number of bays in a warehouse, cut it down to be fewer. Um, that's selective compression. But there's also compressive selection. Um, and compressive selection is when you're under a lot of pressure and you have to make a decision. No, that's not true. Um, compressive selection is when you choose an element over another element in your concept because it's more achievable. So let's say I have a, um, I'll, I'll just stick with something I know a little bit. Um, oh, a, a layout may be based on uh, the town of Downey uh, in Southern California. I'm working on a, just finished a layout or I'm in the middle of working on a layout for that area. There are a couple of huge plants in that area. Um, now the person I'm designing this for already made the decision, but let me give you an example of how this might work. There's a huge GM plant, a manufacturing plant, dozens and dozens of tracks, covers a very large area. That's one industry in the area. There's also a Firestone tire plant, which is big, but not as big. So if I'm going to represent one big industry on this layout, because that's all the space we have for, I'm going to choose, I'm going to make a compressive selection. I'm going to choose the smaller of the industries. This could be packing houses in Southern California, could be mines in Appalachia, rather than choosing a huge mine with a half dozen tracks under the tipple, I'm gonna choose two or three smaller mines or a truck dump. I'm gonna make a selection that causes, still is the same traffic, still much of the same character, but I'm choosing the smaller elements to model. Another important factor is modulating fidelity. So um, what this means is that I may model one scene in a lot of detail and use a lot of space. Another scene, I may make more compromises and do a little more freelance on it. So I'm modulating fidelity. It's not the same everywhere. Um, maybe in one town, I'm saying, you know, one location, I'm saying, okay, I want to handle 30 cars at this industry because the real thing handled 60 and that's a good, uh, a good ratio for me. But then in another industry, elsewhere on the layout, maybe I'm going to compress it even more. I'm going to compress it four times or five times because I want to be able to say, yes, I'm reflecting the area, but I'm going to do it to varying degrees in varying various places. Another piece when we're doing our structural design is to make a savvy decision about modeling standards. Very often I see people talking about well, I'm working on my four by eight and I'm using number eight turnouts for more realism. Okay, Sparky, that's good. But uh, in fact, those are very unbalanced standards. Um, the, the minimum radius is much smaller than your turnout. So trying to find the right balance there. And again, this is something you could modulate. One scene could be beautifully laid out with very long turnouts 
um, and very broad curves. But to keep the thing in the room, you might need smaller curves in the turn back curves. Um, so finding that balance is important. You don't want one model or one crossover to dictate the entire rest of the layout. And as I said before, use staging wherever you can. Model what you must, model what you're interested in, model what communicates the concept, tells the story you want to tell, but stage the rest. Um, and this is a, a sometimes a difficult thing for people to grasp who've always loved this 100 mile stretch of the Penzi. I got news for you, it's not gonna fit. So let's find the two mile stretch of the Penzi or the five mile stretch of the Penzi that really tells the story you wanna tell. Focus on that, stage the rest. Now, we're gonna sketch now to scale. As I mentioned, party time is over. The conceptual phase, that lovely dreamy phase in the clouds, that's over. Time to be, we gotta to work to scale now. Um, so uh, Armstrong squares, if you're hand, hand drawing, these are based on minimum radius. Not as many people know about Armstrong squares anymore, but it's basically the reason that the concept was invented was so that John Armstrong could do these sketches, do multiple sketches and have a rough rule of thumb for how large um, a turn back curve is, how long a yard ladder is and so on. So that's certainly a way to do it if you are hand drawing um, or with templates, um, uh, bring your eraser, very important. Um, Model Railroad specific CAD is a great tool, but don't get bogged down in the details at this stage. You still wanna be able to model what you need to, to be sure that it fits. That part's gotta be to scale, but don't get wrapped around the axle at this point with a yard throat because who knows that yard may be in a different place by the time you're done. And always, um, if you do one thing for me, please draw in the benchwork edge. Otherwise, you're just, you're, you're fooling yourself um, um, because aisles, access, these things really matter now. You're making decisions now, they're gonna dictate the form of the layout in the room. So you gotta keep it real, gotta show those benchwork edges. Um, you gotta be realistic uh, about um, what it takes to actually fit a layout into the space. Also at this point, you wanna do a grade check and you wanna be sure to allow transitions from level to grade and back. A lot of people don't. They create a hockey stick um, uh, grade profile. A lot of published layouts do that too. A little, little secret. Um, and you have to be able to recognize that you need transitions in and out of the grade. Otherwise the grade becomes very steep, much steeper than you expect. You're gonna size your elements, towns, passing sidings and so on. Um, I often, when I'm drawing, draw circles uh, in the corners or where I think the turn back curves are going to be. And then connecting those circles shows you where the, the straight track is. I always try a spiral, a G shape, a J shape, almost always. Um, if you're thinking about, is this an island layout? Is this a shelf layout? The answer is yes. Most layouts are a mix of shelf uh, areas and standalone areas in peninsulas. When I'm doing this um, sizing uh, of elements, I use a, a, a phrase I think I first heard Don Mitchell um, talk about, which was um, lineals. Um, and lineals are your typical target train length. If it's 10 cars plus power and caboose, if it's 20 cars plus power and caboose, that lineal becomes the yardstick that you can then apply all around the layout. Staging, that yeah, better be a lineal long. Passing sightings needs to be a lineal unless you know there's some special situation. Um, yards, think about your lineals. So now this becomes um, kind of this guideline that you can move around the layout as you design. And all of this, basically what we're doing 
is we're managing blobs. Um, the turn back curves at the ends of peninsulas, um, at the end of a shelf, um, they are just as frightening as, as the blob in the movie. So you want to be able to um, take a, uh, a real careful look at your minimum radius, where that fits. All of this goes into building um, this structural footprint of the layout before any detailed design. Now, when we're talking about managing blobs, um, one of the things I often see people do is they'll take a rectangular space like this and throw in 20 small peninsulas. And it is true, this gives you the longest run um, for a given space, usually. The problem is, unless you are modeling a very twisty prototype, most railroads, real life railroads, are straight for a lot of the space. And between the curvy bits, they're pretty straight. Um, and when you design a structural footprint like this, um, you don't really have a spot for a yard. So if you look at um, kind of these percentages, basically half of this layout is curves. Now in the same space, same minimum radius, all of that, if we do a G, it's shorter, I'll give you that, but look how much potentially straight track there is. Now you can put cosmetic curves in those straight areas, um, twist it up a bit, but now we have more spaces for um, yards, potentially spaces for towns, spaces where we can, um, uh, you know, give room to an element, give room to a, an industry or something. And it's a much more straightforward walking path um, for um, uh, visitors and operators. So um, as you're thinking about this, you want to try to think about, yes, maximizing the run very often is the case, but also you want to optimize for some straight sections usually for some of these elements on real railroads that are very often very straight. Uh, the other thing I want you to remember, see the space, not the rectangle, not rectangles. So many model railroads are just rectangles plopped down. Uh, it hurts my eyes. Um, there are cases where a rectangle is worthwhile. Modular layouts um, sometimes make more sense with rectangles, but not always. Um, the tracks are going to curve to stay in the room. Bench work should too. The space, the, the space you have is too precious to waste on corners by making your layout rectangular. Um, uh, it can be more efficient. You can often fit broader curves. You can reach better, better access, better aisles. Um, see the space, not a rectangle. So here are some uh, examples of um, structural footprints that saw the space, not rectangles. And one of the things I want to point out here is um, that um, where we have, uh, let's see, let me, where we have some kind of a weird thing in the room, like this jutting obstruction into the room, um, making something not rectangular really helps that fit a lot better. Um, the other thing that I can point out here is very often where you have something jutting into the room, launching a peninsula from that space, we do has, happens again here, um, can often be a really, really um, a useful tool in making things more efficient. So um, uh, again, look how curvy this bench work is. Um, and yet there are spaces um, for um, yards, maybe with a bit of an angle to it, um, for a yard again here, um, for uh, a yard here um, that's a bit curved uh, and so on. So um, we wanna be able to see the whole space, not rectangles, think in terms of curves um, and let that be part of your guide in your structural um, footprint phase. Now, um, part of this uh, structural footprint um, effort is thinking about the traffic patterns. 
um, for open top loads uh, like coal, uh, unless you have some very specific situations like uh, Alan McClelland imagined for the VNO. Um, you uh, want to have open top loads moving through. The loaded coal should always go in one direction in most cases. Um, but things like if you have a, a lot of pasture trains on your layout, being able to reuse those high cost um, uh, uh, consists is pretty important. So loops can be important. Uh, how long does it take to turn a train at terminals? A through or a loop uh, concept might work best. Um, what options does it give you for continue, uh, continuous run? And very often, I always suggest um, that you want to have, for the most part, um, a linear route rather than alternate routes. Uh, railroads can't take an alternate switch at Chicago and uh, go immediately into Los Angeles. There's a lot of ground in between. Um, so um, thinking about that linear uh, pathway, please don't call it sincere. There are sincere layouts that aren't linear. Um, uh, also, we're thinking about aisles now. Um, there's uh, a trade-off between best practices, your personal preference, and what's practical in your space. You can have a very tight space for one person kind of crab walking <clears throat> down an aisle just for maintenance. Two people can pass. It's a moment. Uh, it's not a life um, commitment. Uh, uh, sometimes you'll have a situation where one person will be working in a yard or something and one person passing um, or two working back to back. Various amounts of space um, and broader is always better um, depending on uh, your situation and your um, uh, prototype, your space, where the crews are located. Uh, staging is not necessarily a track arrangement. It's a concept. It's an operating th scheme. It represents somewhere else that's not modeled. It's your connection to the rest of the world. Um, these could be hidden yards. They could be visible yards, like an interchange yard. Um, they can be active, where uh, people call that a mole very often, um, where, um, uh, which I think first, very first came from Gary Siegel's layout and then has been um, incorporated into others where a person changes consists on the fly during the session. Um, car floats and ferries, um, cassettes, these things become part of your schematic um, decision. Where is staging going to be and how are we going to implement it? Um, but again, it's a function. It's not a track arrangement. So it could just be a visible track in your layout that's an interchange track that represents your connection to the outside world. That's staging. Um, once through or more, um, again, this is a matter of personal preference. You can um, go twice around the room, separating the space, not talking about multiple deck now. This is multiple passes. Um, so, um, you want to try to trade off the longer run of multiple passes with the visual distraction of a train going through a scene twice. Um, you can separate the laps in various ways um, with some elevation difference. Uh, with creeks are an excellent way to do this. It was a John Armstrong suggestion, um, uh, a ridge line, and so on. Um, if you space your town so that the operators are not right on, <clears throat> right on top of each other or the scenes right on top of each other, um, all of these things help. So, um, uh, and uh, of course, multi-deck, we're not going to talk about that in detail, but it's really a trade-off of the length of run versus the complexity of construction and maintenance. Another thing I'd like you to remember, if you're thinking about multi-deck layout, you got to hold the thing up. Gravity, not just a serving suggestion, it's the law. And um, holding up the second deck is um, something that a lot of published plans don't consider. Um, a stud wall is good, for example. Um, shells from a wall can be good. And if you're thinking about a helix to get from one uh, level to the other, um, you're still stuck with physics. Um, tight curves, um, steep grades, uh, that is a recipe for disaster. So um, there are other ways to connect uh, or not connect multiple decks. 
Um, you can build a helix around the room. Um, you can have unconnected decks linked by operations and staging. This is a concept that's a little bit hard to understand and I'm, I won't belabor it now, but people that I've designed layouts for that did this, where a train is heading to a branch, it goes into staging on one deck and then a similar but not identical train exits from staging on another deck to run the branch. It is a concept that works great. No helix, no around the room grade. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, in any case, whatever you're doing to get from deck to deck, um, you need to recognize that some of that run will be hidden. How much of that can you stand? Um, aisle congestion is going to increase. Um, you'd want to try to avoid putting busy areas right on top of each other and think about increasing aisles. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, Travers for a couple of, oh, uh, yeah, turn it over to Travers for a couple of minutes to talk about the layout design SIG. Uh, I'm going to step away for a moment and then uh, we'll be back and we'll talk about an example of going through these phases. Oh, we'll answer some questions and then we'll talk about an example of going through these phases. And one thing before, just um, we got about 90% of the people have done the poll. If you can finish that up, um, I'd like to share that um, before we start into the next phase. Well, um, we're glad that you're all here. Uh, my screen is showing 180. That, uh, that's a pretty good turnout. Uh, and welcome to the presentation of the condensed version of the uh, Layout Design uh, Special Interest Group Boot Camp. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the presentation and gathering some thoughts and ideas about your layout planning and operation. Uh, the LD SIG traditionally presents this uh, four hour version of the boot camp on the opening Monday of the NMRA National Convention. Um, we follow that with a half hour individual consultation sessions throughout the week with several experienced layout design members and for attendees of the convention to discuss or review their own plans and ideas. And we'll talk more about that uh, a bit later in the day. We're gonna ask you all to think about renewing your memberships in the LD SIG and especially those who are not current members joining the group. Uh, easiest way to sign up is going to the LD SIG website um, which is simply ldsig.org. Uh, and clicking on the Join Renew Now button in the upper right corner of the main page. This will bring up a fillable form for entering your contact information, type and duration of membership and payment options. Uh, the button on the bottom of the screen will take you to the PayPal page where you can pay with your PayPal account or a credit card. Uh, we do not retain your payment information. If you're paying for a check made out to the LD SIG, please uh, make a copy of the application form and mail it with your check to the address shown on the application. You can even join right now. Uh, what does the LD SIG offer you? The LD SIG is a federally recognized 501c3 nonprofit organization aimed at model train layout design and track planning. We exist to help modelers in planning satisfying layouts whether you are on the continuum of uh, watch and run through small scale switching districts. Uh, we can offer guidance in assisting you in prioritizing planning and avoiding customary mistakes. We will help you get the best out of your layout and your space. We do this through the Layout Design Journal, our compilation of articles submitted about layout design. Uh, considered the premier publication dealing with layout design, we can delve more deeply into the subject and thinking behind the plan than the conventional commercial hobby press typically does. We target quarterly publication. However, sometimes issues get in the way and Byron will address that. Um, therefore, the membership runs in cycles with four issues of the journal per cycle. Uh, that way you receive the full value of membership rather than having it be a, a year long um, uh, membership. Uh, we also participate in national and regional meetings and 
in this time of travel restrictions through electronic meetings such as this one. Uh, we occasionally offer clinics and help sessions at division meetings and have held meetings in homes. Uh, our website uh, is there with several tools for sharing ideas, collaboration, and getting advice from other uh, members, operators, and modelers. Uh, we have the LDSIG at groups.io um, list, the Facebook page, and on the uh, website, there are hints, tips, and the LDSIG primer. Uh, there's an index to the topics contained in each issue of the LDJ and the opportunity to purchase back issues with tons of track plans and information on bringing the plan to fruition. Uh, the LDSIG serves as a means to make friends and connections with folks with similar interests and the potential for networking. Many prominent model railroaders contributed to the articles in the LDJ, including Bruce Chubb, Tony Coaster, Jack Ozanich, Joe Fugate, and many others. While we focus on the design of layouts, we can't totally isolate the operational aspects of model railroading. We can see that a lot of the operational detail needed to be thought about, processed, and decided upon in the design phase of the track plan because those divisions affect what trackage you may want and or need for the layout. We also consider revisions and rebuilding of layouts, often with thoughts of refining the plan for operations. And we just think about a lot of us are in the baby boomer stage and life is short. Get a jump start on planning your railroad, join the LDC. And back to Chris and Byron. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Travers, for that commercial announcement <clears throat> or non-commercial announcement. And I should seriously um, say a word about the um, layout design journal. <clears throat> I apologize for the delay. We are, um, we will have the next journal, number 68, into um, the mail before Thanksgiving. Um, that'll also be distributed um, online. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, for download for members. So um, uh, we had some family um, issues that have caused a delay and uh, we're back on track now, uh, pardon the pun. And um, I'm really excited about um, number 67 actually, um, and uh, or number 68, I'm sorry, and uh, hope you will enjoy it. Okay, so Chris, what do we have for, or, or whoever, um, um, Chris is sharing the poll results. Um, well, two thirds of you are members of the SIG. Glad to have you with us. For the other third, <clears throat> the handout includes a membership application form. So get to that this afternoon, won't you? Yeah, and um, for those, sorry, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, go. Those who had registered before yesterday morning, you should have got a message with a link to the handout. Um, for those who registered in the last 24 hours, you didn't get that, but there's a link I put in chat to, to the handout. So welcome, especially welcome to those in Australia and New Zealand up at the crack of um, <laughs> oh dark 30. Um, thank you for being with us. Um, and uh, Wow, look at the number of folks um, trying to fit a layout idea into the available space. I feel you, brother. I feel you. Um, this is, this is a, a, a big challenge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and um, trying to adapt um, to a new operating scheme. Interesting. Um, and uh, the... Um, the choices on what you would like to see next. Also very interesting and helpful. Thank you. Chris, did you want to say anything else about the, um, the polls or the results? Um, no, um, other than we appreciate the, the input here. We'll, we'll use this in um, def, um, trying to lay out what we're going to be doing next. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Um, we also, um, plan on obviously we don't have a lot of people up in new zealand and australia right now um doing this again after the beginning of the year at a different time that would be um 
uh, more favorable without getting Byron up too early. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for well, it's be later in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah be later in the day for me. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, now that's all um, I had on that, and I think. Um, questions um our moderators was there any that you wanted to bring up i saw a lot of them were answered in the um in the chat there were a couple that i thought were uh, would be really good to bring up right now one um was a really a basic question byron can you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean when you said spiral just okay yeah so a spiral is um uh, just this. Uh, let me let me jump to a slide. If I can get there, uh, that's not the slide I want. Um, so here's uh, an example of a spiral. Um, this is um, the the pink circles are 30 inches, as it happens. The orange circles are 24 inches in diameter. <clears throat> but you can see how. It, how the how the layout curves around like in a big G. It, this is a this is what we talk about in a spiral. There are lots of examples. Um, it just happens to be an efficient way to design a layout. Only two turn back curves, um, and depending on where the aisles are, uh, this can be a really good way to fit. So I hope that kind of explains what a spiral is. Okay. Thank you. Um, another uh, question that came up is, um, what's the typical output of the concept phase? Uh, good question. We, we did talk about that a little bit, but it <clears throat> was early and some people may have uh, not quite had enough coffee yet. <clears throat> um, it is, it depends on what people, how people work. Some people like words and writing a document um, can help to talk about what things you want to include in your layout, what theme, what story, what feeling you want to evoke. Some people can do it with sketches. I'm going to show an example um, next of how uh, one, one way to capture a concept with those kinds of sketches. Some people want to kind of build a scrapbook of prototype scenes. Um, uh, so um, it's whatever works best for you. Um, what I find works best for me in, in helping other people design layouts is um, to have some of, a little bit of both, mostly words because people can express things that they can't draw or can't find a photo of, but words and maybe a photo or two, um, uh, you know, that just helps you capture the idea that you wanna then express. That's really the, the secret, or not the secret, but the goal. Okay, um, and another question, since that was about concept phase, someone asked um, if multiple runs through the design phase can help you refine the concept, like- Yes, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. And I should have mentioned that. Um, sometimes you will iterate. You'll go back as you're, as you're doing the, the structural phase and say, you know, this is not working and I'm beginning to think I don't really care about that cement plant. Um, and that can take you back to the concept. So absolutely, I should have mentioned that. Um, but, but again, you don't wanna be in paralysis um, analysis, analysis paralysis forever. Um, you wanna be able to move along at some point, but yes, the, the later phases can inform, uh, can set you back to the earlier phase. And then I don't, I, there's one question I want to make sure we get in, um, and this could be a good lead into getting started again, or we could do more. Um, someone asked about a typical, a ratio or of um, typical scenes to signature scenes. And ah, uh, yeah, I'm going to, a... uh, does a typical signature, typical, does a, typical to signature ratio exist after which the layout starts to look contrived? Oh boy, that's an excellent question. And I, I don't know of an answer that I can just say, oh, it's five to two or whatever. <laughs> um, but I think, um, 
you know, the typicality can also be in the, in the signature scene to a degree. You know, you, you just don't want things that are so contrived and so unique that it just screams um, model railroad, you know. You, um, so I think, you know, the signature scenes are the spice, the, um, the typicality is the rice, um, and you want to, well, that's not a good, that's not a good analogy. Um, you want to have some mix uh, and it's really probably a personal preference, but that's, that's a really good question um, and not a great answer. Um, okay, let's uh, continue on because I know we're, uh, the time is, is going. I, I see Chris looking at his watch and I, right. I, I, <laughs> I feel you. Um, okay, so let's do an example, shall we? Um, so this is the Visea Electric, which was a, at one time was an electric interurban, uh, later on was a Southern Pacific branch um, served by diesels. Um, this, um, uh, that map that you're seeing there is kind of to scale uh, of the key areas. Um, this is the Central Valley of uh, Southern California, I mean, of Central Valley of California. Um, and you see Santa Fe tracks uh, in red, the SP is in green, uh, the blue there is the Visalia electric. So um, the, this um, fellow that wanted to build this layout, really the concept that he was interested in was in recreating specific signature scenes. Um, the town of Exeter, the town of Lemon Cove, and at least two more. He wanted those to look those <clears throat> to look and feel like the real thing because the goal was his conceptual um, mantra was experience history through operations. So with those scenes on the Visea Electric, um, he wanted some Southern Pacific for context, um, was gonna be a switching focus um, in the 1950s. So in probably the diesel area era, but with a potential future backdate to the interurban area. A uh, small number of operators and significant space between towns. The real area is pretty wide open. Um, you go through a lot of farm fields um, between towns, even today. So here are the signature scenes. Exeter, which was um, the place that the uh, Visay Electric interchanged with the Southern Pacific, had a very distinctive scene uh, with the car shop, car barn and shops in the Y um, and uh, Lemon Cove with this very unique curved uh, set of packing houses uh, curved right through the town. Um, and then a couple more that he was interested in, but really the, the primary goal was uh, Exeter and Lemon Cove. That's the prime directive. Anything else we could get in would be fine. Um, and I recommend, um, uh, Philip's uh, Kauk's book um, on the Visea Electric. If you're interested, it's a it's a terrific book looking in detail at a, a you know a small, very monogenic um, prototype. Uh, these are um, John Signor's um, uh, illustrations from that book. So I've got a concept now: um, experience history through operations. We've got a couple of key scenes, signature scenes that we really wanna have, need some SP focus. Okay, that's our concept. And so from that, uh, someone was asking earlier about what do you do to communicate the concept? Here's what I did. Now, this was hand-drawn for me. Uh, I've, I've redrawn it um, electronically for, the, um, for this presentation. But notice, one thing to notice, it's not to scale. It's like you're in a dream and all of a sudden, you know, something looms large. It's, it, everything's not to the same scale. So I drew the towns, especially the towns of interest in a lot of detail. Um, this is to give me an idea of what's important before I start structural sketching. We're still in the conceptual phase. This is the map I drew myself uh, to help guide me in the design. Um, and um, I'm really trying to see the relationships between elements um, and not worried at this point about scale, about boundaries, 
uh, about anything. This is very unbounded at this point because I don't know until I get to the structural phase what's going to be what's going to fit and what's not. I, I want to try to keep an open mind at at this stage. So here's the space. <clears throat> it's a basement. Um, some of you are familiar with basements. I live in California. I'm not. Um, but uh, there are some obstructions. Um, there's a, you know, there's a crawl space that we have to have some access to. Um, doesn't have to be especially easy access. Only one column uh, to support. At the bottom of the image there, you can see there's one wall with a seepage problem that has to stay clear. Um, so that's the space we're dealing with. Um, and um, uh, I didn't mention it, but um, one or two duck unders would be okay, um, or actually one duck under would be okay if not needed all the time. So one duck under or removable bench work. So <sighs> Exeter. Now, Ys are a pain. Um, Ys are a pain because they go off in three directions. Um, and if you want them all to be active, that can be a real problem, especially in HO and larger scales. So what I did here was make a decision early on that um, the SP was not going to run through. The SP was going to run to Exeter and not beyond. Just enough length there for a runaround. Um, so I'm truncating the SP, which runs up and down California. Um, and because I've got this wall that I can't put bench work against, I'm going to use that for the aisle. So I'm looking for a place for straight tracks. This is a long, this is the longest wall. Um, and I want to be able to uh, fit this, the most difficult element, which is a Y, um, and the top signature element. So Exeter is placed. We are now in the structural design phase. Things are to scale, not in a lot of detail, but um, so that I know what will fit. Now, um, the next step is try a spiral. Now, this spiral is a little misshapen because it's the shape of the eventual bench work. When I first did it, it wasn't, didn't have all the nooks and crannies. It was just a spiral. But I could see that Maybe I could fit this spiral in. I like to capture columns and other obstructions inside bench work when possible so they don't clog an aisle. Um, and uh, because it's going to be a point to point kind of a layout, maybe I can get away with one blob uh, and go all the way in, go around the blob and come all the way back out. So um, now I, I call this an anchored island. So there's this island peninsula, but it's anchored to the wall in um, a couple of places. So this is the spiral. Um, you can see it goes around um, to the blob at the end. Um, and this seemed like it was gonna be a good approach. Now, there were two or three others that uh, didn't work at all. Um, and to save you time and my embarrassment, uh, I am not showing those. So now um, the curved signature scenes, if you remember Rocky Hill and Lemon Cove uh, were curved scenes and they were important. Where can I fit those? Well, there just happened to be a couple of spots and a lot of serendipity is involved. Um, in this case, I discovered that Rocky Hill, which has a branch that I thought was just gonna be truncated and not active, turns out that might fit. Lemon Cove gets a good spot um, long enough. Um, the, I'm picking places on the bench work where the spiral is curving in the right way to support um, these scenes. Because remember, the replicating these key scenes was an important part of the concept. So now maybe there's a way to get a continuous run in here. Um, there's a branch that comes off near Merriman um, that maybe I could connect back to this narrow shelf um, to use for a continuous run. Maybe that can be a removable piece of bench work um, so that um, it's not a, a duck under. Um, so, wow, Merriman fits. 
maybe a continuous run. This is looking better and better all the time. At this point, I thought I might actually be able to finish the design. And the rest is just details. Simply a matter of details. But you can see now that um, uh, it's a very busy slide with all of this in here. Um, this layout was featured in Model Railroad Planning 2009. Um, and um, I want to just point out a couple of things. Um, there's uh, some interchange here with the SP. Um, the SP staging is behind a backdrop here. I always want to make double use of bench work wherever I can. So here there is staging and then there is also um, a visible scene of Visaya, which is a beautiful station. Uh, we just get the, the flat here. Um, but the main interchange happens here um, in Exeter, in these interchange tracks. And then from here, the rest of the layout is a Visaya electric layout. Here's that branch I talked about earlier, um, which kind of just fits into this extra space here um, near the mechanical room. Um, and, uh, you know, we were able to build in this bridge scene. Lemon Cove is um, uh, curved as on the prototype. Um, and um, uh, Rocky Hill, another key scene is here. There's some typicality with the citrus groves. <clears throat> Excuse me. I get a little choked up just thinking about citrus groves. Um, and, uh, and so on. So really the important points here are we started with this conceptual design, some key scenes, a very not to scale map, conceptual map that works well for me. I'm a visual kind of learner. Some people work better with words. Some people work better with, um, you know, having talking it out with someone. For me, that visual map was so important. So um, you can read more about this in Model Road Planning 2009 if you are interested and have that issue. So now that I've so cavalierly pointed out throwing in details, let's talk about them. Um, so these are where we can take advantage of some layout design best practices. As I mentioned before, really trying to find balance. Um, um, staging capacity, passing side and length, yard track length, using our lineals. Um, how do we balance out our room space for all of these things? Sometimes as we work out the details, that will move us back to a structural iteration. We can say, well, if we move this curve, this yard could be a little longer. But you don't want to let the tail wag the dog. You don't want to let um, something that uh, is interesting in one little intricate scene ruin the rest of the footprint. And a phrase from um, aircraft and automobile design, you want to simplificate and add lightness wherever you can. Um, so you don't want too much complexity um, and uh, getting locked into a couple of scenes that you've worked on in CAD can sometimes uh, make things uh, create uh, kind of a, an anchor of complexity for you. So there's this concept layout design elements um, has been become popular over the last 15 or so years. Um, and some people say to me, hey, it's just LDEs, right? Just throw a few together. I'm going to take this one from the um, Rio Grande in 1950, this one from the Visay Electric in 1932, and this one over here from the CNO um, at the turn of the century. And they'll all work together, right? No. So the prototype arrangement is no guarantee of model success. Um, and that's because <clears throat> the prototype has maybe hundreds of miles of other track in each direction that is doing things that you don't know about. It may be crossovers, it may be other towns, it may be there are there are things out of outside of this one scene. And mixing LDEs from different areas or, or eras can be problematic because um, they were designed to work a certain way. Um, and they may not work well together. Um, there are also sometimes that you need to include um, some model needs that aren't important, that, that aren't visible in the prototype. For example, Dave Adams, a modeler here uh, in this area, discovered that he had to add a crossover um, to make the, um, the layout work right. 
Um, now, in that case, I think maybe that crossover was in the real thing and he didn't know why. But sometimes you will find that you need a run around, you need a crossover, you need something that's not visible in that town to make the model work the way you want it to. And often that's because we want to run more trains through our layout than real railroads supported. If you're running 30 trains in a four hour session, Rick Fortin, um, you may find that it's just too much for uh, a, a true prototypical layout. So you may have to make some compromises, do some things for the model. And uh, again, the, the example that I, I use is these are all prototypes. You could glue pieces of them together and it would all be fine, right? Yeah, maybe not. Um, so uh, LDEs, great idea. Excellent, especially in the conceptual phase to think about what's in a town. Um, but as you design, especially in the detail phase, you may need to make some changes and some compromises. Yards. Seth, usually in the boot camp, the four hour boot camp, does 50 minutes on yards and it's great. And I'm going to do like three minutes. Um, so uh, maybe one of the future sessions we'll do is um, Seth's yard portion of the boot camp. It's terrific. But let's talk about yards. Um, does every layout need a yard? The answer is no. Um, certainly not visible, maybe staging. Um, in real life, um, very often because of low density of trains, um, a lot of crews would do yard switching out on the line, just a convenient um, siding, even a spur, and they would sort themselves out. Um, staging can be helpful to represent distant yards. Uh, you want to stage when you can, yard if you must. But what if you like yards? I like yards a lot. I like working yards. I like designing yards. I like looking at yards. I don't like raking the yard. It's a, it's a very different thing. Um, but there are all kinds of yards. There aren't just division point yards. There are industry support yards. Uh, Seth has one of these on his layout, a, a yard that supports a, um, an auto plant and a couple of assorted industries. Um, I wrote a couple of articles on that in a recent, well, a while back in an LGJ for cement plants, which have yards and uh, auto plants. Um, very often there'll be an industry support yard, does a lot of switching, uh, but it's not of the scope of a division point yard. And very often, almost always doesn't have engine service facilities. We talked about a junction yard um, where um, uh, branch line trains might terminate and originate. An interchange yard where a foreign railroad um, leaves off cars, sets up cars. Any of these could be part of your layout or the only yard in your layout or a branch terminus. Um, these smaller prototype yards are still fun. They still offer um, some classification, some switching, but they're more achievable and more modelgenic than <clears throat> a big division point yard for a lot of us in the space we have. So I recommend if you if you want a yard, um, think about maybe as part of your concept, is there some point where there's a smaller type of yard that might be useful? Um, a, a lot of people, I have taken grief um, many times on um, internet forums, and you know that bothers me so much when people give me grief on internet forums. I'm just broken up for days um, about putting in yard leads. People say, oh, the real railroad didn't have a yard lead. And it's true. In many cases, smaller yards, four, six, eight tracks, did not have a yard lead. But the density in real life railroads is much less the train density, the throughput, the number of trains. And so a yard lead is really, really an excellent choice many times on the model because it allows a crew to work the yard without fouling the main. And in our um, you know, Northeast corridor type um, frequencies of trains, um, uh, we need all the help we can get. So the main line is short, uh, takes time to switch in the yard. Those are out of balance. Um, so the yard lead really is a great um, ad addition. Um, and very often having that connect back to the main line at the end of the yard lead is a good way to let trains out of staging or I mean, out of the yard or into the yard um, when things are congested. So yard leads, even if the prototype didn't have it, this is another area where you may wanna modify the prototype um, 
in order to support more trains through the scene in a given time. And you say, well, it, the prototype ran four trains through the scene a day. Yeah, but your op session is two hours long. That's four trains in two hours. That's much, much more dense than the real life um, scene. So yard leads, good idea. So now we're gonna do some detailed drawing. How do we do it? Um, by hand, you can be. Uh, you can do it by hand. There are, uh, you can make your own templates or buy commercial templates. Um, you can copy uh, or scan patterns of the turnouts you wanna use. Um, and you wanna make sure that lines are square. Very often what happens is you will have a curve, which I represent here, and a straight track, a tangent track that attaches. And if that tangent track attaches at just the slightest off angle in your hand drawing, the thing is really not gonna fit in real life. So you gotta be, if you're hand drawing, you gotta make sure those um, interfaces are all square. Um, Model Railroad specific CAD, CAD rail, Third Planet, which I use, any rail, um, Extract CAD, all good products, very complicated to learn for the most part. Um, <clears throat> and um, it's a lot of learning curve for just one layout. So that's a thing to consider. If you like working on the computer, and you enjoy that sort of thing, then maybe it's worth it. Um, but for one layout for yourself, um, a, uh, you know, a careful hand drawing uh, plan may be the, the case. A lot of people want to use general purpose CAD like AutoCAD, um, which can be okay. The problem is making templates that are really exactly matching commercial turnouts, including room for the points, <laughs> um, reasonable frog angles, and so on. But certainly that's another tool you can use. Other computer drawing tools I don't recommend, like a, uh, well, I don't even know what the current thing is all the cool young kids use. Um, but, uh, you know, like Visio, something like that, that a lot of people are familiar with. Very tough to maintain your standards in terms of curve radius and um, templates uh, for uh, turnouts and such. So um, can be done, the degree of difficulty increases. So those are our three layout design phases. Conceptual, big, broad, unbounded, open your mind, structural, got to be a little more specific now, to scale, fits the space you have, and then detail. The key is draw no line before it is time. So thank you very much. Um, uh, we have a couple more slides uh, just to reiterate. Um, Travers, if you want to say anything more about uh, just, again, feel free to join the SIG. We're gonna take some questions after this. Um, for those of you who are still with us, thank you for hanging in. Um, uh, Travers, did you wanna uh, just uh, highlight any of these things quickly? Uh, I would just uh, ask people again to go to the ldsig.org uh, page or main page on the website. And in the upper right-hand corner is the join, uh, uh, renew now, button and that will get you to the application page if there's any questions certainly you can uh, contact uh, us through the contact page on the um, on the website and or i think it's in the about section and if there are any questions on what is um, available as benefits to the joining the ld sig um, there's a spot for that but don't hesitate to ask and the other thing I talk about is things that we are planning to do in the future, as we've alluded to already, in terms of repeating this clinic. And uh, we've got a slide showing now on some upcoming ideas. And sign up. Join us. Thanks. And really yeah. would appreciate any um, input that you have on things you'd like to see. Um, um, go ahead and put them in the um, in the chat, and um, we'll we'll look at those. So um, great! Do we have any more questions, Bob, or whoever is capturing questions? Um, we have a few more general questions, and uh, um, and I don't think we'll.
cover all of them, but I would encourage the people to um, take a look at the Facebook page or the groups.io um, uh, for layout design um, to post their specific questions. Like there, but there were some good comments in the chat, a question about a complex helix design, and, and there was some real good feedback from others there. Um, um, it was from Jarrett. Um, one basic question, Byron, was how large was the room that you put the Visalia Electric in? Ah, oh, boy, good question. Um, the one foot squares in the those are, those are one foot squares. Yeah, let me jump back there. Um, so that was about, it was a, looked like it was about 30 plus feet wide um, from my counting squares. It's a, it was a pretty big room. The challenge was um, really the, um, uh, the wall that we couldn't use. Um, and these spaces, the mechanical and bathroom and so on, that we needed to keep access to. So um, somebody can count faster than I can. That was a big space. Um, and so we were able to uh, give a lot of room between, or significant room between towns and really let them breathe. So it was, you know, we had the benefit of a lot of space there. Right, um, Steve looked up the MRP article. It was 22 by 32. Thank you, Steve. Um, um, and then a, a conception, you know, a, a question, a big question for today. Like any, any, well, I guess you gave a lot of tips. So maybe I should just let it be covered by what you said about going between yards and staging to utilize the space the best. Oh, you okay. A lot of time talking about that, but. Yeah, so just, um, I think the basic principle I think you're referring to, Bob, or the, the person with the question is referring to, is placing, if you're going to model one visible yard, like one big yard, uh, a division point yard, um, I place it, often place it very close to staging at one end of the layout. Um, and the reason there is that you want to maximize the run in one direction mm -hmm. rather than split it up between two directions. Right. Um, and, but the, the downside is that the one direction, the movement from the yard to the staging and back or whatever, um, is very short. And so you kind of want to give that to a train master, uh, the, the operating session impresario, uh, or a hostler or something like that. So that, um, most of the crews, most of the runs, are longer mainline runs. Is that is that addressing the issue you, you were yeah, talking about? Yeah, I think about? so. Um, I I found the question in the chat, and it it goes it adds on after what I said, creating longer runs. And so what yes. you said about moving the yard to one end uh, definitely does that. And I've seen yeah. that in, in a lot of very successful railroads. Um, yeah, because the the instinct is to put it in the middle. That that's your first thought, uh, I think, is to put it in the middle. And sometimes you know that's the choice, but um, I really recommend thinking about putting it at one end near staging um, to um, maximize the run in the other direction. Um, and one more question, you know, and again, I'll, there were some other questions that I think some people have, have answered or are um, extremely detailed. So I'll, I'll leave out, but someone asked a question, which is an interesting idea um, about providing a space between the active track and the back of the layout um, with the idea that it's a buffer. And I'm now going to see if I can find the, the question. It was quite a long time ago. Um, One of but, the first questions, Bob. Yeah, yeah I know. Um, while while Bob's any? looking for that, I'll... Uh, uh, Okay. Time in that one of the other things that we haven't talked about is we've talked a lot about planning today, but once you get going, the important thing is to start operating as soon as you can, right. even before you finish building the rest of the layout. There's um, things that you'll learn in the beginning that you'll want to change as you go on. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. We didn't talk about building in phases, but that's absolutely right, Travers. <clears throat> um, 
um, Bill Kaufman says, once you have um, a place to start and a place to run to and do something, start operating. So, you know, that could be staging to one town. It could be a yard to one town. Um, it could be, you know, very, very limited trackage, but start early, operate early, operate often, and it will help inform the rest. That's, that's a very good, very good point. Um, I found the question, um, I'll read it. Is there any advantage to leaving the back several inches of the layout devoid of track and using it for a scenery buffer between the wall and the operating portion of the railroad? In other words, is the layout more enjoyable to operate if there's more depth to the scenery? Boy, what a good question. And uh, the answer is, it depends. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of personal preference, I think. Um, the... Um, uh, you know, you, you're always doing this trade-off of scenery realism versus operating capability. Um, Lance Mendheim had a beautiful N-scale layout um, before he uh, went to the HO um, kind of terminal uh, layouts um, based on the Monon. And there were some scenes where he did have that distance between the track and the backdrop. Of course, in N-scale, it's less absolute distance. Um, and it did add, of course, he's a master modeler and beautiful scenery and all of that. But um, I think it can add. Um, I don't, I think it's one of those trade-offs of saying, how deep is the shelf? How much track do I need? Um, and one of the things I should have had in the presentation and did not, um, is you want to modulate, it's, it's probably obvious, but you want to modulate the width of the bench work. It doesn't have to be two feet deep everywhere and shouldn't be probably. So you can have narrower scenes, broader scenes. Um, and that question of what to do with the space between the track and the backdrop, I think comes into that part of that discussion and those decisions. So it's a really good question. Um, there's no, you know, pat answer. Uh, it really varies from person to person and prototype to prototype. Okay. Um Byron, did you do you have a, a particular name for this concept of um, the space saving, you know, helix of letting a train disappear and then a clone reappear at a different level? Do you have a, some catchy name for that? Well, it's not catchy at all, but it's um, ops and operations and staging linked decks. <laughs> ops, operations and staging linked decks. Yep. So because these are these are two independent decks. Um, the only connection between them is operations and staging. Okay, so <clears throat> and short line division. Yeah, and and um, I have I have had to talk a few people into it in terms of um, what would work best for their layout. They are very happy with it, um, but it's it's unusual and um, uh, not not common. Yeah. All right. Um, like I said, there are a few other questions and the chat's going on with some distance information. So hopefully the person that asked would will keep an eye on the chat. Um, and I, oh, here we go. Is it recommended to have the main line in front or in back of a yard scene? Oh, uh, <clears throat> another good question. Um, okay. All, all other things being equal, it's probably better to have the main line at the back. Um, and uh, Don Mitchell in particular has talked about um, where you have the choice, aligning the yard ladder so that the end car is more visible um, rather than the opposite way. Um, so there are times when you can't help but put the main line in front. If the train density is not too much, not too high, it's not too bad. Um, but, um, you know, having it at the back is probably the easiest in a lot of cases, if you have a choice. What did you do on your layout, Bob, for the main line? Uh, it's closer to the aisle because I'm modeling an east-west railroad and the yard was on the north side. Yeah, so sometimes you have no choice, right? You're, you, mm -hmm. The scene would look funny if you did it the other way. Plus, my branch line comes out and disappears 
towards the backdrop. So, you know, it, to, put, to put the yard on the other side and the main line in the back, would it, the, the branch would have had to cross the main line. Yeah, so there's a, there's a great example of making a choice based on the prototype and what you need to do to get the branch off the scene. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was one question uh, about whether um, we're recording this and is it going to be published? So yes, it is being recorded. Um, we haven't figured out exactly when we'll publish it, but um, um, it the plan is to to have it available um, for um, to get to. But we're also, as Travers mentioned, we're also planning on doing more of these and recreating this. You know, doing it at different times for the different time zones, etc. So, you know, it, it, the recording available in the near term, but we'll be doing it again live in the future. So some of these questions that didn't get answered, um, I'm going to um, actually ask them on some of our forums. So if you, you know, if you, I'll, I'll republish them there for, for people. So make sure you're part of the um, Facebook group and uh, are the um, IO group. Anything else? This is well, Doug Gurren. Am I on? Yes, yes, Doug. And Doug, by the way, is the founder of the Layout Design SIG. So we're glad he's here, although he certainly could have given the presentation today. We're glad he's with us. Well, I've uh, certainly made my own new mistakes and old mistakes, but there were a number of places where I thought I might supplement the excellent points that Byron was making. And um, I'd like the uh, moderators to cut me off at any point if, you know, these seem undue. But let me begin with talking about the, um, the way you conceptualize the layout. And I would urge people to think about what jobs railroading jobs they want to end up with when they're all done and what are the associated trains, traffic, support systems, aisle space connected with them. I think too often you come up with a geometry of tracks and then try and graft on it jobs and often there's constraints or things aren't quite right. So I would encourage people to think about what railroading jobs they want to end up with and to make the list as inclusive in terms of getting a realistic handle about how many people you might want to get together with and then the diversity of the jobs and so on. So that was one point. Another place where you're at the conceptual stage that's been useful for many people is they sort of bounce all over the place and they end up wanting to model a place that they rail fanned as a teenager, or as a young adult, or at some other pivotal point in their life. And so perhaps your journey in the hobby could be, you know, fast, faster for your layout design if you did something you know, of that sort is to think about where you've done your rail fanning. I would also say that you know, many people like the idea of a longer run, but real railroaders got paid to run long distances and they're not necessarily high payoff areas in terms of you know, operations per foot or operating vignettes per foot. So you might wanna explore ways to uh, imply the long runs, but focus on the, the more action-oriented centers. Um, one of the common mistakes that's made when people are planning past sightings is that they don't have very many of them, even though they might want to operate something like timetable and train order, where a variety of, of meets is desirable. The fewer of those sightings that you have, perhaps the more important it is that they be relatively evenly spaced and, and matched to the lineal or even to the longest train you might be running. Otherwise, trains end up waiting, you know, for an opportunity to get past over the railroad because there's no intermediate spot suitable for them. John Armstrong had another interesting point. He made a distinction between functional standards and cosmetic standards. So you might like broad curves, but he would say, you know, be careful because if you pick too broad a curves, you might be limiting your options. So he thought more in terms of functional curves and sharper turnouts where they'll operate reliably, 
um, and put your cosmetic features, you know, out in the public, but don't be limited to just one kind of a radius. Uh, one of the key issues that we haven't explored here that probably would be a good session to talk about really is um, planning your aisles. Um, Don Mitchell repeatedly has talked about since our layouts are operated by people, we should design for people and then, you know, put the layout in the remaining space. And I would suggest that even though in general, the sketches that Byron provided in terms of the pace of people's spaces, that people are getting heavier. Many of the people who are older might want seats that have legs that intrude into the aisle space. As we move towards higher standards of operation, we need more things along the fascia strip that intrude into the aisle space and essentially net limit or narrow down the functional width of the aisles so that you might have even something like four feet. But by the time you put in shelves for sorting car cards or other kinds of things, um, you don't really have the full width for clearances that you're thinking about. Uh, so think really carefully about aisle space and say, when in doubt, pick aisle space over bench work depth where you can, because people seldom regret it. And it's often been hard for people to carve out wider aisles once the, the layout is, um, is built. Uh, I would put in a plug for the um, model railroad planning issue number in 1996. It contains um, a feature article on helix design. Helixes get a bad name. Many of them are bad, but there are better ways to design them. And they do offer a lot more flexibility if they're designed with people in mind and the functional things that go along with it. Um, I would like to plant the seed with people that when you're conceptualizing, think in terms of stories, but not necessarily in the conventional way of a, a collection of realistic prototype or operational scenes. Stories, for example, like in my case, modeling World War II, or it could be the twilight of steam, or you know the effect of um, the merger on the railroading operations. These things add a level of sophistication and interest that makes it more than just a routine collection of little switching zones that might themselves be visually interesting, but they don't tell a bigger, a bigger picture. Um, another notion to consider, especially if you're older or you move a lot, is to think about what part of this layout is most important to you, and then ask, is there a way that I can build it first with that temporary staging perhaps on either side or one side, just in case I never get to finish the whole thing, um, I will have at least achieved something useful and satisfying, um, which might not be the case if you just think of starting at one end of this linear layout and working your way to the other. And uh, lastly, to leave room somewhere in the vicinity of your operations or in an adjacent room for, for people to, to sit down and rest, for people to sign up for traffic, for trains that they wanna run, place to sit down and read the instructions that they might have to operate on. Um, that relates a little bit to another point. As people get older, they seem to like to have a stool to sit on or someplace to sit down while they're waiting for a bead or a signal to change. All these different operating supports um, should also at some point be introduced uh, pragmatically, if not conceptually. So those are some of the high points and I hope that they're worthwhile considering. So um, thanks. Um, I'd like to also like to um, point out, um, and Seth just put a link in the chat room of upcoming Barrier uh, um, Sig Meet virtual um, in January. I can't remember the exact dates of it. I, even though I just signed up, I think it's the end of January. Seth, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, that's uh, January thirtieth. Is the uh, clinic and panel presentation. And on January 31st, we'll be having a series of virtual layout tours. And uh, it'll be a combination of uh, professionally produced video tours and uh, 
PowerPoint type tours, and we'll have uh, opportunities for you to do a Zoom Q&A with the various layout owners. And we'll be mostly featuring Bay Area layouts or layouts that were kind of our traditional drive-in, drive-out layouts uh, as we uh, <clears throat> drew from anywhere from uh, uh, Los Angeles area up to Portland and people would come in and we tried to have some layouts for them to visit on their on their journey and break it up a little bit. So, you know, the, the idea is uh, obviously to open up the meet since it's virtual anyway. Uh, we have a, and you'll see on the link page, uh, the pr presenters that are, you know, currently uh, uh, planning to present and uh, I'll get a little bit more uh, layout tour information up as we get a little bit closer. So we'd love to see you all there. Uh, you know, again, we've got the uh, 500 seat Zoom license. So uh, uh, feel free to come uh, wherever you are, tell your friends, uh, uh, feel free to drop in and out of the call as it goes on. Uh, we'd love to see you and share what we have. All right, um, the other quick plug, uh, um, put in is um, uh, the PCR convention in Fresno in April of 2021. Um, there's information out on that. I don't have, um, if somebody can actually put the link in the, the chat, that would help, but um, that is um, one of the upcoming things um, in, in the future. I have a comment for uh, regarding Doug's uh, comments. Go ahead, Gary. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Uh, my layout is uh, designed to be wheelchair accessible. Uh, so, uh, and this is a O scale in a uh, 10 by 20 room. So the entire center area has to be clear for that kind of access. It's also set at a 30 inch height because it's designed to be uh, operated from a seated position. So th those are kind of, uh, you know, complications that, you know, in, when you're looking at the space and how much room you have to leave, that's a, that's a critical issue for my layout. And I was also thinking that if I ever had to expand the layout that an obsolete level uh, would be a way to do it because I, you know, I won't have be able to use the interior spaces of the of the room for spirals and all the rest of that. So, uh, anyway, I, I enjoy Doug's uh, comments in that area of, of, uh, of uh, aisle space. So. Yeah, and I, I think Gary, um, uh, I just want to mention that Gary's layout will be published in um, the next MRP. Um, so um, watch for it there. Um, and uh, Gary's done a couple of other really interesting things um, using um, modular, a sectional modular benchwork. Um, it's really a very achievable thing um, that um, people can learn a lesson from doing a little less and making, uh, still putting uh, a lot of fun and engaging operations into less benchwork, less track. I'd like to add an, an echo to what he just suggested, which is that the, while the basic layout might be at an ergonomically higher level, like 40 inches or, or 50 inches, um, it's feasible, and Bill Darnably has written about this, to have perhaps a switching section at a lower level, like 30 inches. Um, it's been my experience in watching other operators that sometimes people are temporarily handicapped or disabled. That is that they've had a leg injury or they're just tired and they want to sit down for the op session. So if you think about diversifying the jobs, using the space to its fullest, you might consider at some point um, allowing room for something at a low level like Gary was just talking about for people who would like to operate at a, at a sitting level, even if they're not necessarily confined to a wheelchair. All right, I think with that, I want to again uh, thank Byron for a great presentation um, and um, think call this session to an end.
Yeah, let me just jump in with one last thing, Chris. Sorry. Um, so I do. And you're never down. You're never done with the railroad. I'm never done. Uh, nor nor with the with the webinar. Um, I do, um, as mentioned, edit a magazine, the Layout Design Journal, which I highly recommend. Um, and I do need articles. So please feel free to email me at ldjeditor at gmail.com. Operators are standing by 24 hours a day to take your email. Uh, and um, uh, so this can be uh, an article on your layout, an article on a layout you've seen. It can be photos with captions. Um, it can be, uh, uh, we're open to a lot of ideas. So um, I know some of the people on here are given, you know, that's a make new mistakes and introductory um, uh, session. Some of the people are probably new to design, but some of you, I recognize your names. I know who you are and um, you could write me an article. So um, send me uh, an email and would love to have you in the, featured in the magazine. Okay, now I'm done, Chris. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Byron. All and right. A special uh, thank you to Byron and Chris for keeping this thing moving and, uh, and fun. Really appreciate it. So thank you. you for attending. Thanks everyone for attending.